When I'm recording episodes for the podcast, Leadership is Changing, there are some that go very well. And of course, all of them go really well. But the thing is, there's some that just go extremely well. In fact, I don't want the conversation to stop. Well, this episode was like that. The gentleman's name is John Becker. And John is the founder and CEO of an organization called Hardvark Tactical. Now, that's a leading provider of tactical equipment and custom solutions. And he's also the founder of the armor manufacturer, Project 7. He's sort of supplied things like tactical equipment and solutions to law enforcement organizations and military organizations as well. And if you think of things like Navy SEAL, SWAT teams and things like that, this is the guy that's been supplying them. It's been amazing. The conversation was awesome. Now, he's also got a podcast called The Debrief, and you might want to check that out. But also, he runs Ironman triathlons, racing sports cars, and he speaks for tactical organizations around the United States. Now, we talked about creating a culture of servant leadership. Now, he talks about creating an environment where people can thrive. The other thing we talked about was that leadership is like fitness, and we have to be conscious about it as well. But the thing he said, which was really quite cool, amongst a whole lot of other stuff he said that was great, was that the more humble people or leaders are, the calmer they are. So the more humble a leader is, the calmer they are, which is really amazing. So I don't want to sort of hold back anymore. I just want you to sit back, relax, or if you're out there walking or doing whatever you're doing, exercising, or listen to this in the car, wherever it is you're listening, really enjoy this interview. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey there, listeners. Welcome to another wonderful episode of the Leadership is Changing podcast. Great to have you here with us today. We have a wonderful guest with me today. His name is John Becker. John, welcome to you. Thanks, Dennis. Great to be with you. Now, where about in the world are you today? About 30 miles northeast of Los Angeles in California in the United States. Oh, very good. That's excellent. Now, I've given the listeners a little bit of an introduction to you. Tell us more about your background. So, I started my business when I was 17 doing rock climbing equipment. And Right away, started to deal with military units and special operations groups who were buying ropes and harnesses and carabiners. And kind of my, my mantra was I didn't want to be a sales guy. I wanted to understand the product and be of value to my consumer and kind of add value. And I didn't really understand it in those terms at that point, but that's kind of what I wanted to do. So I spent a great deal of time studying and learning about the product and was fortunate enough that the first real clients I had in law enforcement and military were kind of the founders of, of SWAT as a concept in the United States. And, and it's, I always say that I learned to hit from Babe Ruth and I learned to dance from Fred Astaire. And so I was, I was brought up by those guys at, at my twenties. I went to law school. I spent two years working in LAPD's police litigation unit, worked on a Rodney King, Reginald Denny, a bunch of the big, you know, law enforcement cases. And the business just went in that direction. And so, you know, now 55, you know, 38 years later, we do primarily law enforcement and military equipment mostly protective equipment, and really geared towards tactical operators. So people that would do tactical intervention, whether it's, you know, Navy SEALs or LAPD SWAT or Australian Defense Forces type of of operators. Oh, wow. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, we're going to really look forward to this conversation. It's going to be really good. We're going to get into some areas as well. Now, I also understand that you've done some Ironman triathlons into racing sports cars. You do some speaking with tactical organizations across um, across the U.S., Anything else you like doing? Yeah, no, I I like sports that take me to uncomfortable places. I learned early on, both as a leader and a human being, that the more time I spend pushing my own boundaries, whether that's putting myself in situations where I'm scared, putting myself in situations where I don't know what I'm doing, or in the case of racing, putting myself in situations where I'm I'm overwhelmed and, and have to learn an entirely new discipline, that is really where I grow and how I develop. And so that's kind of Everything that I do for fun is geared towards pushing my own limits. Mm. Mm. You know, when you say that, because I think it's really interesting that I think in leadership today, whatever the field or industry is, are we pushing ourselves enough today as leaders? Are we taking it to the boundaries, the limits? What are we doing? I mean, we are facing times 
or we face things at times which are the unknown, right? The ambiguity. We're not sure. We don't even know what we're doing sometimes. Do you think leaders are actually pushing themselves enough? No, absolutely not. And COVID certainly hurt this, right? COVID, COVID kind of sent us all back to our caves to, to, to kind of wall ourselves off and be afraid that the, the plague was going to get us. I think it triggered a lot of primitive thoughts for a lot of people. And I think we kind of, for lack of a better term, you know, if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs, I think COVID pushed us all back down the triangle. And I think the result is that a lot of leaders have become managers. They've become reactionary. And they've, you know, we, we've been dealing with so many difficult situations and so much change over the last few years that it's become very easy to avoid development and to avoid true leadership. So no, I don't think we are. Not even close. Yeah. Okay. So I, I agree with you totally. I think they are avoiding things as well. What can we do with leaders today to sort of say to them, hey, you need to wake up. You need to step up. You need to not avoid things. Let's, do you, any ideas on what you think should actually happen here to help them? I think, I think the first thing is that every leader should, you know, if, if you lead a group of two people, one of your primary objectives should be developing yourself, mm. should be focusing on making you as good at your job as you can possibly be and, 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 you know, helping you to understand what it is to lead other people and, and what it is to care about culture and how to set a culture and lead a culture. And I think that one of the things that I've learned in, in dealing with so many military units and so many special operations groups and just amazing leaders is the really effective units, the really elite units are elite because they are brilliant at fundamentals. They spend a great deal of time focusing on all of the little things and the execution of the little things. And it's, it's interesting. I, I just recently interviewed a guy named Master Sergeant Earl Plumley, who's a Congressional Medal of Honor winner for Afghanistan, who, if you listen to the episode, the story will literally just make you light your man card on fire. It's, it's, it is a ridiculous story. You wouldn't believe it if it was a movie. One of the things Earl said when I talked to him was what enabled him to perform at such a high level was that all of the little things, marksmanship, reloading, movement, tactical awareness, they had drilled into him so many times that he didn't think about them anymore. And I think as leaders, we need to understand the basics of leading people and the basics of what those who work for us do at a very deep level so we can focus on the higher aspect things. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a few things that you're sharing there. The basics is really important. And I think some people try to make it too fancy. No, let's go back to the basics. Keep it simple. One. Two is drill it, keep going, keep practicing, keep doing what you need to do, because then it becomes second nature. Third thing would be is that eye for detail. And it's what you're saying is about the execution of it, that it's, it's focusing on it so good, so well, that it does become elite. And I think that it's mastering, becoming the master of what you do is really important. Well, I think as leaders, it's also easy, especially as young leaders, it's easy to think that your job is to manage people. I would say, you know, systems are managed, right? Quality is managed. Air conditioning systems are managed. People are led. Mm. And as a leader, your job is to develop the people who work for you to get as much out of them as you can, right? I would say that, that each person has 100% potential. And some of those have 100% potential that's 100%. And some of them have 100% potential that's 70%. Your job is to get the full 70%. It's to get the full 100%. And the only way that happens is if you are focused on developing them and caring for them and providing an environment where they can flourish, you know, it's, it's too often people look at it as like, oh, you know, my job is to hit them with a stick when they get out of line. Yeah. You know, your job is to make sure they don't get out of line. Your job yeah. is, is to create an environment for them where they thrive and are happy and are, and are enjoying their job and can be passionate about what they're doing so that they never have to get out of line. And, and it's, you know, that's one of the differences for me between management and leadership, right? Management is constantly hitting people with a stick. Leadership is never needing to use the stick. Yeah, I agree. And I think the thing is, it's about, it's about you setting them up for success straight away. And oh, it's, I, love, I love what you just said there, create an environment where they thrive. I think that's, that's spot on. Now, you mentioned a couple of times just before about, you know, and you've got this episode and so forth. So you've got a your podcast yourself, right? Yes. Yeah, it's called The Debrief. And it's focused on tactical topics. I interview law enforcement, military leaders 
influential people, people that kind of created the market or people that have been through, you know, harrowing events, you know, it's really focused on a tactical audience that we have, we have a crossover business audience that listens to it because they're all amazing leaders, Mm -hmm. but it's really focused on trying to provide the tactical community with paradigms, right? So much of what they do, much like leading so much of what you do is paradigm-based decision-making, right? You look mm -hmm. at something and you go, I always use the example of water, right? There's three forms of water, you know, solid, liquid, and gas. If you only know water as a liquid, you don't understand solid and gas, right? Once you've seen ice, then you know, oh, that's, that's frozen water. But if you don't, you have to draw inferences. And mm -hmm. so much in a tactical environment, the decision-making is inferential. This situation is like this other situation except this, there's this difference. Same thing with doctors, right? They look at it and they're like, oh, this is like. So part of the goal of the podcast is to capture the stories of these guys so that other people can hear them and file them away. So when they find themselves in those situations, they have that paradigm. Yeah. And what I realized early on is there is, there's no, we're in such a small industry that there's no formalized vehicle for a lot of that information to get out. So I, I recently interviewed one of the team leaders for the Bataclan hostage rescue in Paris. And went through the whole story. Now, nobody in the very few people in the U.S. are ever going to act with, interact with these guys. They're never going to hear this story firsthand. So by creating a platform to share these stories, now every tactical officer or military person in the world, theoretically, can listen to that. And that's one more paradigm. So that's really the, the primary goal of the podcast is, is yeah, officer cool. safety. Yeah, okay, good. And so what sort of made you decide to start that podcast? So I, I've spent almost my entire adult life invisible to the internet. I spent, you know, I say I was invisible for 35 years. I, I always kind of kept myself out of it. I didn't really write much outside of the tactical community. I didn't give public presentations. And a few years back, one of our friends died, got ALS and died. And there were several of us standing at his funeral and having a conversation about how much information we lost that day. This is a guy with 60 years of experience, both military and law enforcement. He's a fusion thinker. He, you know, he understands both doctrines and can put them together and teach. And he was an amazing guy. His name was Tim Anderson. When Tim died, the tactical community lost everything in Tim's head because we had never recorded him on video. He had never been recorded on audio. He hadn't written a book. And so all that information was gone. And, and I remember saying to a couple of the guys at the funeral, like, we need to do something about this. Somebody needs to capture these lessons learned. Somebody needs to interview these guys. Somebody needs to write this stuff down. And that one of them pointed out the problem for law enforcement in the military, and I know it's true in the U.S. and North America and Europe, and I'm sure it's probably true in New Zealand, there is no upside for law enforcement or military to talk to the media. There's, they're not going to win because if they say 99 smart things and one stupid thing, the one stupid thing will lead the newscast that night and the 99 things will be on the floor. So they said, look, if you want to do that, you're going to have to do it because we're not going to talk to just anybody. We got to talk to somebody we know we can trust that is not going to twist the messaging and will actually put out the true stories. And after several months of conversations with people, I realized that I could trade my privacy for their legacy. Mm -hmm. And that was a good trade because the amount of, of knowledge to be gained by listening to these guys and, and hearing their stories and hearing their views on leadership and the way they solve problems and make decisions is so great that it was worth the trade. So that was yeah. when we started the podcast. It was just over a year ago. Fascinating. Oh, that's awesome. And I, I really, really relate to what you're saying there, which is brilliant too. I, I think it'd be the conversation. So listeners, if you haven't checked it out, that's a podcast called The Debrief and, and check it out. It'd be worthwhile having a listen to. Now, I, I've got a question here, which tends to be around, you know, how did you get into leadership? But I think we actually have already covered that, actually. I think we, we saw more or less. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that sort of question. No, I, I involuntarily got into leadership. I started my business and my business grew and then I had to hire somebody and then I hired somebody else yep. and quickly realized that I was so outclassed and so, you know, inept for the task that I needed to get really smart really fast or I was going to drown. Yeah. And, and that was the point that I began to study leadership was probably about 20, 25 years ago was the point that I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm really not very good at this and, and I'm surrounded by people that are. And so I started having conversations and asking questions and going to classes and, and, you know, going to tactical leadership classes and kind of, you know, I, I say I was trained for leadership by osmotic learning. I, I've mm. been immersed in amazing leaders for 35 years and some of it apparently stuck, yep. but I can't tell you how. Okay. 
But it's also great that you you acknowledge the fact that you didn't understand or didn't know, and then you went out and did something with it, and you went out there and learned, which is great, because I think there's a group of leaders out there today who, well, managers maybe, who have been promoted and things like that. They think they know it all. They're trying to be everything to everybody. They're trying to provide the answer all the time, but they don't go out there and learn. They don't keep themselves on the cutting edge to be that elite, to be that thing that you talked about before, which is going to be world-class, really good at what you do, depend, you know, whatever that is. And I don't see a lot of people doing it. I see people who are doing it, which is great, but I think there needs to be more. I think, I think leadership is like fitness. If you're not consciously developing it, it's getting worse. Yes. Right? If you're not stepping on the scale every morning, you're getting fat. And it's, you know, we have an obligation to the people we lead to be the best we can possibly be. And you know, it kind of goes back to Dunning-Kruger, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. The, the, the less you know about a topic, the more you tend to think you know about a topic. Yeah, yeah. And, and I find that the, the first year police officer who's new to a tactical team really understands everything and is ready to go. The guy that's led a tactical team for 30 years, if you say, hey, what don't you know? That will be a two hour conversation and he'll have notes and probably slides because you just begin to realize as you get older and you lead more, you, the more you understand about the topic, the more you realize you don't understand and the more you want to understand. And so I think as leaders, if you're not constantly developing yourself, you're not going to be a good leader. Like mm. y- you have to be turning yourself inside out and, and really focusing on your own shortfalls and weaknesses and the things you don't understand if, if you want to do an effective job of leading, especially in a time, you know, going back to the topic for the podcast, leadership is changing and it's changing culturally dramatically right now. And if you're not catching up and keeping up, you're not a good leader. Mm. That, that bit that you just said there, if you're not keeping up, I think is, is really relevant as well, because I feel that a lot of leaders, as I was saying before, they're not staying relevant and they're not keeping up. And so they're being overtaken. Yeah, so it's good. And I think you've always, always just covered as well. But I'm going to ask the question around, the, the title here is called Leadership is Changing. Outside of what you've just said, is there anything else that you might want to say that about what it means for you today? What is leadership is changing? What does it mean? So I think that it, probably more than any time in my career, the culture of an organization is absolutely critical. And, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, well, it's a generational thing and these millennials or these Gen Zs and, you know, they don't like this and they don't like that. And, and I don't actually think it is a generational thing. I think that the concept of work and the concept of work-life balance is changing. I think it's evolving. I think we are realizing we have, you know, 60 to 100 years on this rock, and it's either going to be really good or really bad, and you got to figure it out. And that as much as you may like work, in the end, all we really have are our relationships with human beings. Like that is the thing that that really makes life enjoyable is, is our relationships. And I think that in many ways, we are beginning to find a better balance between the two. And I think people are really beginning to care more about what work is like and how work fits into their overall concept of life. And as leaders, we've got to, we've got to understand that. And, you know, I think that's probably the biggest change that's happened. I think that, you know, telecommuting and you know, evolution of the internet and all of these things have kind of redefined how you can work. But I think COVID gave the entire world a moment to go, I could die tomorrow. Is this really worth it? And I think more than any time in my life and, and your life since we're basically the same age, leadership is changing and we're having to look at what it means to lead and what it means to work and what a work environment actually should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that you're right. COVID has sort of woken people up a bit, it sort of emphasized things or sort of like made it a lot bigger. People have gone like, whoa, what's going on here? And life is fragile. And as you said earlier on, you know, once somebody dies, there's a whole lot of intellectual property. There's a whole lot of ideas, thoughts, experiences that goes with that person. And we we miss out on actually doing it. But also while you're on this rock, as you called it, you've got to go and do the best that you can do and be the best you can be if you're wanting to. Now, the thing here, what I'm finding, John, is that people are probably going back to what you said as well before about leadership and fitness and it's about being conscious about it. I think for a lot of people, they need to understand and be conscious about the fact that we need to look at the work-life balance, but also at the same time, we've got things to do. You know, you can be working from home, you can have the work-life balance, but we've also got a business to run. We've still got things to get on and do, which is really important. 
So all aspects need to be looked at, not just one area. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Now, I'm sort of going to come back to a question that I wanted to ask you, which was around who's your favorite leader and why. Now, this person could be alive or history, and I'm actually going to really look forward to what you say here based on the people that you've worked with. So I think it's very difficult for me to pick a single person, but there is a common skill set among the great leaders that I work with that it, I think is what I really admire, right, is, is this kind of ethos in leadership being a servant to the people that, that you lead, of, of being individually accountable to, to the people that you work with. You know, if I had to say it's, it manifested to a single person, I'd probably say it was one of my early mentors, which was a man named Sid Hale, who was a lot of the reason that Aardvark ended up being Aardvark was because of Sid. But Sid is, is, is a good archetype of this kind of overarching type of person who have that work-life balance and who are strong strong-willed, brave, yep. but gentle, soft, caring, compassionate. One of the things that I always loved about Sid was he had this balance between being a warrior, and he was a CW05 in the Marine Corps and a commander in the LA County Sheriff's Department and one of the early guys in, in SWAT for the Sheriff's Department and, and, a, and a worldwide you know, thought leader in, in that area, but also had great relationships with his kids, would play with your dog when he saw them, acted like a child at times, like was able to walk that balance is, is the only word I can use. We are too inclined to become one thing. And, and I think that if, if I had to, to pick one, it would probably be him. Yeah. I think it's multiple dimensions or that, that they can work at and it depends on the level. So people say to me, well, when I go into organization, Dennis, you're talking to the CEO next minute, you're talking to frontline leaders and, and others as well. How can you do that? And it's just like you adapt to the audience, you adapt to where you are. And if you, if you can do that and you've got that skill to do it, that's powerful. Very, very powerful. Well, I think more importantly, just from the time we talked before and now, you care about people. Mm -hmm. And if you care about people and you're interested in people, you can talk to anybody. Yep. Because what it really comes down to is you're not talking about you, you're talking about them. Correct. And, and you're focusing on what they care about. You know, my wife and I had a conversation years ago where she, she's like, you can talk to anybody. You can meet somebody in the grocery store, talk to them. You can talk to the doctor. You can talk to whoever. Why is that? And I said, because I'm interested in them. I want to know what makes them tick. And one of the questions that I ask people when I meet them is, what are you passionate about? And sometimes that, you know, it could be whiskey. It could be, you know, football. It could be, you know, New, New Zealand All Blacks. It could be Whoa. rock music. But if you find out what people care about, you, you not only learn about them, but you connect to them in a way that then extends that relationship beyond the scope of just that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I, I think it's also, I like what you said before too about the, I'm calling it, you said ethos, so I'm going to call it the leadership ethos is really about being a servant to the people you lead. And I think that's all part of that. And if you can ask people questions, I mean, John, I, I always really get quite intrigued by people saying to me, oh, you're a great conversationalist. What do you mean? Oh, you're a great communicator. What do you mean? Oh, you ask really good questions. And I'm like, okay, but that's what a person does. People don't, really care who you are, what you do, and things like that until they know that you care about them, right? And then that's where they, they will come along with you on the journey. That's my Angelou, right? The, the famous my Angelou quote. People won't remember what you said. They won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And, you know, from a leadership standpoint, that is 100% true hmm. with the people that you lead. You know, it's, it's very easy as a leader, especially as a, as a, you know, higher executive in an organization to communicate only with the people that directly report to you and the people at the top of the food chain. And I can make an argument that those are the least important people you interact with. Mm. And, you know, and you think about it, like when I'm walking through the warehouse, if I stop and talk to one of our sewers or I stop and talk to one, you know, somebody in manufacturing or somebody in the warehouse, like they're one of, you know, X number of people that work for me that, that I interact with. I'm the only CEO they interact with. And so that, that interaction takes on an asymmetric responsibility right? I have one opportunity with that person to interact with them and leave them better and leave them feeling connected to the organization and caring. And if you screw that up, you do so much damage to the organization. And, and you know, it does, you, you are a servant of the organization and the farther up the organization you have, the more masters you have. And if you don't recognize that and take advantage of those opportunities to say, hey, you know, how are you? Like, what's going on with you? I spend a lot of time talking to the people in our company saying, what am I doing wrong? Help me understand how I can be better at my job. 
and help me understand how I can make what you do easier or more effective. And, you know, it's the organization is not there to serve the leader. The leader's there to serve the organization. And if you get that twisted, yep. you will not do an effective job of leading. Mm, brilliant. I love it. Well done. I think that's spot on. So, listeners, if you're not out there to serve the organization, then you need to just go look in the mirror and start asking yourself some really interesting questions and ask people around you what you might need to do. I think John's sharing some fantastic stuff here. John, earlier on, you talked about the the teams, the tactical teams, the elite, and so forth. What's going through their minds? How do they prepare for a situation they're about to go into? What's going through their minds? What about their confidence and things like that? How does that all work? So it's interesting. It's something I've thought about for a long time because there's kind of a paradox, which is the more experienced somebody is, the more effective they are, the more elite they are. Generally speaking, I find the more humble they are, the calmer they are. And the more they are relying on their preparation. So what makes elite teams elite is a couple things. I mean, it it all revolves around culture. Culture is at the core of everything in in these elite units. But certain aspects of the culture stick out to me. And and I'll give you a couple of them. First, individual accountability is front and center. You have an obligation to the team and to every individual on the team and they all hold each other accountable. So there is no like, oh, you know, Dennis is a little fat this month and he hasn't really been running and he's not shooting that well, but that's okay. We'll let him go. You are going to be called out consistently. And part of the way they do that is with objective standards. So, you know, you have to shoot over this percentage. You have to run this fast a mile. Those, those are objective standards that are easy to, you know, to handle. So, you know, when you're not meeting the standard, but you have an obligation to everybody in the organization. And that is front and center. You know, any, you go to any military unit and they will tell you that you are responsible for the man next to you. And so that individual accountability is key. I think they do a very effective job of building strong people. Every single member of the team has to be the best they can possibly be because all of those individual components build the larger whole. And so everybody is responsible for being developed and for developing themselves but there is a culture around excellence that is every single person is going to be as good at everything that they do as they can possibly be because everyone else's lives may at some point depend on your ability to do your job. I think another one that goes hand in hand with that is, is elite units embrace strong personalities. It's very easy as a leader. I actually just wrote an article about this. It's very easy as a leader to take people that are strong and, and have strong opinions and are passionate and marginalize them because they're a pain in the ass. They're annoying. They're argumentative. They don't necessarily fall in. They frequently walk away from the herd. And so it's very easy as a leader to say, oh, well, that guy's a pain in the ass and marginalize them. The problem is elite performance comes from passionate, strong people. Hmm. And so, you know, if, if you, if you are offended by the sharp knives in the drawer, you're going to end up with a drawer full of spoons. And, you know, you you see people that like, man, that guy's really difficult. He's a hard personality. He's argumentative. He's this, he's that. And they push him out to the side. And then they wonder why they don't have high performance. High performance comes from a knife, you know, a drawer full of really sharp knives. And I think these, these units do a very good job of recognizing that and dealing with it. I think that in the world today, we are seeing too many people being mediocre. I see we are seeing a lot of leaders where there's that mediocre kind of attitude and culture. And I think it's wrong. I think we need to 100%. really lift that game, right? No, you you are you are absolutely dead on. We have gotten really good at being average mm. and appreciating the average. And it's almost like, you know, I was using the analogy like, you know, you go out for a run with 10 people. The goal is to try and pull the whole group and make everybody exhausted. It's not to run slow with everybody else. Because if you're running slow with everybody else, you're all getting slower. You have to push each other. And as leaders, we have to push and drive for more, but we've become very good at like, no, I don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to stick out. I don't want to, you know, want to embarrass somebody else. I don't want to call people out. And so what you end up with again is a drawer full of spoons. Yeah. Yeah. I'm never going to look at a drawer of spoons again the same. (laughs) My work, my work here's done. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) It's good. But I, I love the analogy. I love what you're sharing there because I think it's so important for us to think about that. And it doesn't even come down to just leadership either. It could be anything in life. It could be what you're doing in your sporting side of things or anything at all. It's 
whether you're turning up, the way I say it, John, is how are you showing up every single day and what are you doing with it? And if you can knock that ball out of the park, if you can be the best that you can be, that's great. And if you're not, no problem. Go back, do the basics, keep learning, keep growing, keep drawing on other people and helping you lift your game. That's all great. Now, do I have to go and do that? No, because I'm going to say something here, John, and I think you'll I just want to like to see what your thoughts are. Hey, if you don't want to be a leader and you're not willing to do that stuff, that's all cool. Then just move to the side, get out of the way and let somebody else come into that space and be the leader that we need. Lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, one very... of my favorite sayings. No. Yeah. I mean, it's the thing is like, there are people who want to lead and there are people who don't want to lead. Mm. And if you don't want to lead, that's okay. There's no, there's no obligation for you to lead an organization. There's, there is no shame or disgrace or, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a really good widget maker that makes the same widget every day. We absolutely need that, yep. right? As a society, you know, I, I can make an argument that the worker bee is always more important than the queen bee is. And we, we tend to prize leadership and status as a thing in and of itself of value. And I don't believe that it is. I, I believe that what really matters is the line level worker, right? I remember when we built our house, we, we had a lot of people working on the house and we, we brought in lunch every Friday. We'd bring in lunch for the guys and I'd have my kids go out and take it out. And, and one of the guys came up to me who was framing the house and he goes, I don't understand something. I said, what? He says, why do you have your kids serve us? He's like, you guys are building this big house and you, you have a business and you have all these things. And why would you have your kids serve us? I said, you're building our home. What you're doing is more important than what we're doing. Mm. And it's, you know, not everybody needs to lead and not everybody needs to have status. But if you choose to, you damn well better do a good job because everybody below you is counting on you. And, you know, if you want to be a half-ass factory worker, fine, be a half-ass factory worker and you'll disappoint the people around you. But the farther up an organization you go, the more harm you do by not being excellent every day. And if you're not willing to carry the mantle, don't pick it up. Easy. Just don't pick it up. And if you are in a position, listeners, I as a leader today, where you're in that role and you sure it's, and you're not sure it's right for you, you need to do some deep thinking here and you need to understand what's going on, ask people around you. And as we're saying, it's okay for you to step aside because there's nothing worse than a leader being in a role that's not going to be that excellence. They're not going to be at that level. That's great. And they're going to sort of slow the team down or not have the team go up because I think when the tide rises, all boats rise. And if you're not at that tide where you're lifting it, others aren't going to follow either. And so it's okay for you to move on and do other things because there is going to be something else that you're really good at that you really want to do. And it's good. Let's get you into that role and get you underway. Well, I think one thing that I now understand having led for a long time is as a leader, your job is not to be the guy with the right answer. Hmm. Your job is to be the guy that finds the right answer, mm. right? You are responsible for finding the answer, not having it. And so you, as a leader, if you are not harvesting 100% of the people below you, you're not doing your job. I mean, one of my favorite Steve Jobs sayings, he said, we don't hire smart people so we can tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And I think that it's, it's very easy to get twisted in your head as a leader to think, oh, I have to come up with the answer. No, what you have to do is get it out of the people that work for you which means be collaborative, be vulnerable, be willing to admit, hey guys, I don't know what to do here. Help me understand this. Make me smart. I, I say that all the time, make me smart. And, and you know, if, you're, if you are in a position where you are leading and you feel like you're drowning, the best place for you to go for support and education is the people that work for you. Nice. John, we're living in a world whereby, whereby if things tend to be getting a lot faster, technology, data, social, everything seems to be getting faster for us. From a, the, the people that you work with, the leaders that you work with, what are you seeing then? How do they ha what are they preparing themselves to be successful in that fast-changing world? What are they doing to possibly slow things down a bit in that world as well? What are they doing? So... Obviously, you, you know, you got to pay, pay attention to technology and you have to, you have to evolve with the times, right? Your leadership style, your skills have to evolve with the times. But I'll give you an analogy. I race cars for fun. The first time I got in a race car and went out on a track, I drove five laps, got out and laid down for 20 minutes. <laughs> My brain was absolutely drained. 
because there were so many things going on. There was so much noise and people on the track and thinking about the car. And I spent all of my time focusing on fundamentals. How do I become a better driver? What gradually happened was all of that noise went away. The sound of the car, the sound of that. And I began to understand what really mattered. And in the case of driving a race car, it's getting past the guy in front of you. But none of that strategic operational stuff can happen while you're focused in the tactical. If your time is focused on what do I do right now? How do I do this? You're not going to have strategic thought. So as a leader, the best way to keep up with, with evolution and with rapid development is obviously to delegate, push down responsibility, take the tactical off your plate, but also get so good at what you are doing that you no longer have to think about the small aspects and you're allowed to think about it. And I'll tell you, man, the difference between the first time I was in a race car and when I started winning was instead of there being 5,000 thoughts a second going through my brain, there were three or four. Mm. And I had all kinds of time to think about stuff. And, and the longer I lead people and the longer I run a business, the shorter my list of important things gets. So I think, I think that's probably the, the best advice I could give is, is nail the fundamentals to the point that you're thinking about the big picture stuff and you can slow your brain down Yeah, because it's very easy to get caught up in all the noise. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what you just said there too about the fact that you would need to slow our brain down because there is that noise out there. And then next minute there's this ping and everyone's going, oh, what's another email or another meeting or whatever that's going on for life. And you're right. It's too much happening. So how do you slow it down? And I think breathing is one way to doing it. I think focusing sure. on the fundamentals that you just talked about, focusing on the bigger picture, getting out of the weeds and the words being in the tactical space, but being in the more strategic thinking, moving things up to that area as well. Great. They, they're really good. On fitness. I mean, honestly, fitness, physical fitness and mental fitness, taking care of yourself, sleeping well, exercising, like keeping your brain clear, eating well, all of those things have such a profound effect on the amount of fight or flight that is triggered in your body when something dangerous or confusing happens. And, you know, I live in an environment where everybody's constantly in fight or flight, right? Like every one of my end users is, is constantly in life-threatening situations. Yep. The funny thing about it is most of them are less stressed the people I know that are working in a corner cubicle at a law firm, because they've learned to focus on the things that are actually signal and ignore the noise. And they're all fit. They're all healthy. They all are, are exercising. A lot of them are meditating. They're breathing. They're doing things to consciously slow themselves down at a physiological level, because most of stress and overload is actually your body's physical response to the situation. It's not your brain that overloads; it's your body. Your body goes into fight or flight and, and, you know, your body doesn't know the difference between a tiger chasing you and your boss screaming at you. So the more you condition that body and mind to be able to deal with stressful, difficult situations, the more when that happens, your body just goes, oh, this is just like the run we did. Okay, it's fine. We're good. I, I have a saying whereby the, the person who's the calmest is the person who's in control. And I think that's exactly what you've just been saying. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Now, John, if we've talked about employees, we've talked about what they're looking for, we talked about also what we need to do as leaders as well. I think we've covered that area pretty well, unless there's anything else you might want to share around employees' expectations, but I think we're all good in that, yeah. So the other thing is, the other area I would say is, if I was to get you to get your crystal ball out here and think about the future, where does John see leadership being in five years? I think the next five to 10 years is going to be perhaps one of the most transformative times we've seen since maybe the development of the internet. I think that everything's in flux, right? COVID kind of knocked everything into flux. And I think what is a workplace and where do we work and how do we work and how do we interact with people is really in the air right now. And, and we're trying a lot of different experiments and, you know, we have a lot of people working from home and we have people that are, you know, moving out of state and doing all these things. And some of them are working and some of them are terrible and inefficient as hell. But I think that over the next five years, we're going to see that kind of shake out and we're going to learn what kind of jobs can you do remotely? What kind of jobs can't you? What is an effective working environment and, and what does that mean? I think that we will see over the next five to 10 years, the nature of the work environment begin to focus more on the individual. The employees are yelling for it right now. The companies are not yet reacting to it. They're beginning to, right? Like COVID allowed employees to take a great deal of power away from their, from their companies because now they were working from home and now they were setting their own schedules and like things that previously were, were variables or were givens for them were now variables. 
on the heels of COVID, we're starting to see people say, well, no, 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 I'm not coming back to work. I'm going to continue to work remotely. And, and you, you're seeing companies that are firing people. You're seeing companies that are cutting pay, that are demanding they come back to work. And we're seeing this kind of negotiation taking place between companies and the people that work for them. And I think over the next few years, especially going into recession as the U.S. is, we're going to see that kind of, sh you know, shake out and begin to coalesce around, I think, a, dif a different working environment, right? I, I don't think the correct working environment is the Silicon Valley ping pong tables and beanbags. I don't think that the correct working environment is, you know, the old school, you know, telephone farm, you know, office cubicle farm where you're there from nine to five and take a 20 minute break. I think we're going to find this depending on industry, depending on the nature of people and, and all that, where your work environment becomes more individualized and your relationship with the company becomes more individualized. And, and I think that that goes back to serving the people that you work for, create an environment. You know, we, we years ago went away from traditional sick days and just said, you know, you have this much time every year, use it however you want. And, and we didn't do that because it was some brilliant foresight. It was, I didn't want you to lie to me. If you wanted to go watch your kids play, I didn't want you to tell me you were sick. You're an adult, use your time correctly, do your job. And I think that we're starting to see that kind of manifest across the, you know, across the, the planet. And that's, I think, the biggest change over the next five years is we will see a redefining of that balance of work and life and the redefining of the balance of employee rights and, and company interests in a profound way. Yeah. Yeah. Nice way of saying it. I think, I think you're right. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. So John, it's been a pleasure having you on the show with us today. If our listeners are wanting to get hold of you, where should they go? So the, the site for the podcast is the debrief dot live, the debrief, T H E D E B R I F dot live. I've got a LinkedIn profile, which is just under John Becker, you know, happy to share for you for show notes, email contact and all that. Yeah, cool. We'll, we'll have all those in the show notes, which will be all good. But once again, John, been a real pleasure talking to you. So thank you so much for, for joining me. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks for all you do. Awesome. There you go, listeners. If you're more humble, then you can be calm, but also leadership ethos is a servant to the people. You lead. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast moving world. 